Good afternoon and a very warm welcome to the York Festival of Ideas. This afternoon's talk, entitled Chance Memory, the story of a York war poet, is given by Professor Sue Mendes, Professor Emerita at the University of York. Sue is well known as a political philosopher who has worked on the philosophy of toleration and the limits of liberty and on female philosophers and the philosophy of feminism. A fellow of the British Academy, she has served as a vice president for the social sciences. Since her retirement, Sue has broadened her research interests and having qualified as a York Minster guide, she has been busy in the Borthwick archives and researched a number of topics about the Minster and some of its characters. This afternoon's lecture is promoted by the Oliver Sheldon Memorial Trust. The Trust was founded to commemorate the work of Oliver Sheldon, a well-known York figure, a director of Roundtree's company, who devoted his attention to preserving what was best in our city. He was involved in the founding of the York Georgian Society in 1939 and the York Civic Trust just after the war. And it was due in large part to his influence that the Borthwick Institute for Archives was founded in 1949. This institute was at the heart of the foundation of the University of York in 1963, and Sheldon is looked upon as one of its founding fathers. The Sheldon Trust is a charity that exists to promote the history and heritage of York. Sheldon had a vision of York becoming a great centre of art and culture, and the Festival of Ideas would have been a project after his own heart. I'm delighted to present Sue Mendes to you, and I'm sure that her talk on the York War Poet will weave many of these strands into a marvellous tapestry. Over to you, Sue. Thank you, Sarah, for that very kind welcome and introduction. Um, I'd like to begin just by saying that I'm very privileged and pleased to have been invited to, to give the Sheldon Memorial Lecture. I'd like to thank the Trust, obviously, and before I start, I'd also like to thank the staff at the Borthwick, um, particularly Lydia, and staff at the Green Howards Museum in Richmond, particularly Carl, um, for reasons that will become obvious, these people have shown a tremendous um, patience and forbearance with me in these extremely difficult times, and I am most, most grateful to them. So I'll start, I try to do this magic trick of sharing the screen. Um, so <laughs> the title, my title is Chance Memory, the story of a York war poet. But the story doesn't begin in York. It begins here on the South Downs. And this is just a generic picture of the South Downs of the area near Brighton. And there it is, there's a map um, which shows 
the village we're, or town we're interested in, the town of Stenning, right here. And as you can see, it stands at the apex of the triangle that's formed by Worthing on the left there and Brighton on the right. So there's Worthing, there's Brighton, Brighton and here's Stenning. And Sten Stenning is the starting point, this little, little town on the South Downs. And I'm now going to give you just a couple more pictures of the South Downs to give you a sense of your bearings. So here's the South Downs again, this bucolic, rolling, glorious landscape. And here again, an area which I think is an area near Chunktonbury. And we're starting here at Stenning and on the South Downs because the poem I want to talk about is a, poet, is a poem of the Great War and I've always known it as the Stenning poem. I cannot remember a time when I didn't know this poem. Um, I've known it by heart for forever and ever and ever. And here it is. I've always known it as the Stenning poem. And here it is, and I will, I will read it. I can't forget the lane that goes from Stenning to the ring in summertime. And on the down, how larks and linnets sing high in the sun. The wind comes off the sea and, oh, the air. I never knew till now that life in old days was so fair. But now I know it in this filthy rat infested ditch when every shell must kill or spare and God alone knows which. And I am made a beast of prey and this trench is my lair. My God, I never knew till now that those days were so fair. And we assault in half an hour and it's a silly thing. I can't forget the lane that goes from Stenning to the ring. Now, as I said, I've known that poem all my life. I mean, I cannot remember a time when I did not know it, and I've always known it as the Stenning poem. But I've never known who wrote that, that poem. The author of the poem is completely unknown to me, but it seems pretty clearly to be a poem that wears its nature on its face. It's written by a young man who's in the trenches, probably on the Western Front during the Great War, and it's a love song to the area that he loves, to his home area, to Stenning, to the South Downs, and the reference Stenning to the Ring is Chunktonbury Ring. So it's pretty clear that this is a young man in the war, in the trenches, writing longingly from the, the filthy rat infested ditch, thinking longingly of his home. That's pretty much the way it seems to be. But things are not always what they seem. And in fact, this poem was first published, and I apologize for the quality of the next slide. This poem was first published on the 23rd of June, 1916, in the Daily News. Here it is. I'm sorry, it's, it's, it's one of those things I meant to go back and do better. And then we all got locked down and I couldn't. But here it is. It's in the Daily News for the 23rd of January, 1916. It's called Chance Memory. It's not called the Stenning Poem at all. It's called Chance Memory. And the author is given, the poet is given as Philip Johnson. Um, just as an aside, it's a very, very, very small print. It's a very small piece of newspaper. And the rest of the page, pretty much all the rest of the page, is Kipling's account of the way the war is, is going. But, but there it is anyway. Um, and it became, in its own time, a greatly loved poem of the Great War. It was, it was very greatly loved and very familiar, very popular, published in a newspaper. And so it's perhaps no surprise that when the war ended, people generally, and the people of Stenning in particular, were very, very keen to find out what happened to Philip Johnson. He'd written this great love song, this love poem to, to their town, 
and they wanted to know what happened to him. Did he live or did he die? Um, was he married? Did he have children? Did he stay in the army or did he leave? What, what, what went on? And so in 1918, when the war ended, there was a great deal of activity to discover who Philip Johnson was and to commemorate and celebrate him. And so, as you can imagine, there was considerable consternation when nobody could be found, no record could be found anywhere of anybody called Philip Johnson who could possibly have written this poem. There just was no such person. Um, and there was no, no link at all between anyone in any of the records and this, the area of, uh, around Stenning or particularly to this poem. So this was a much regretted mystery in 1918, 1919, and it remained a mystery for half a century. For over 50 years, nobody knew anything about Philip Johnson, the author of this poem. And then in 1969, this man, Ernest Raymond, wrote, uh, discovered who the author was, who the poet was. And um, it's a pity we're not in a real room, as it were, because if we were in a real room, I would be interested to know how many people have heard of Ernest Raymond or read his novels. I, I confess I, I hadn't read any of his novels, but he was born in around 1880 and he died in 1974. He was a very, very prolific and popular author in the 40s, 50s and 60s. I've never read a single word of his, of his novels. And as far as I'm aware, he's just un, uh, almost unknown now. But maybe, that, maybe that's wrong. Maybe it's just that I don't, he, he's certainly unfashionable. Um, but here he is, a very popular author in his time, and most popular for perhaps two, two things. A novel called Tell England, which is about the Great War and the, the young men who went to the Great War, and a sort of reconstruction of the Crippen case called We the Accused. And those are his two most, most famous pieces of work. Anyway, there he is, Ernest Raymond. And in 1970, he published his autobiography under the title, Good Morning, Good People. And in that autobiography, he writes this. In 1916, having recently escaped from the mud and filth of Gallipoli, I was with my brigade in the Sinai Desert, where we were slowly laying a railway through the sands towards Gaza, making straight in the desert a highway to Jerusalem. And one day I chanced upon an old tattered copy of the Daily News and read in it a brief poem whose final couplet seemed to me to capture an English soldier's native patriotism with simpler and more perfect words than any other lines in that luxuriant yield of poetry which sprang from the First World War. Ever a lover of the bare sweeping downs of Sussex, which find their crown in the ring of noble trees on Chunctonbury, I was caught by the title from Stenning to the Ring. So it's a third title for this poem. Now, it's not the Stenning poem, it's not Chance Memory, it's from Stenning to the Ring. And Raymond then, Ernest Raymond concludes, I read the poem once, twice, or thrice maybe, and have been word perfect in it ever since. It was printed over the name Philip Johnson and never from that day in 1916 until two mornings ago, this is 1969, 53 years later have I known who Philip Johnson was or heard of him. So half a century goes by and he does not know and no one knows who Philip Johnson is and then in 1969, on that fateful morning, Ernest Raymond received a letter from the lady in the middle of this picture. There she is. She is in the middle of the picture. She is Miss Hilda Purvis of Bridlington. And she wrote as, followed, as follows. 
Since the death of my brother, Canon J.S. Purvis, in December, I have been searching family news cuttings albums to find an article which you, that's Ernest Raymond, wrote in the Sunday Times of the 22nd of May, 1927. My mother preserved our copy at the time, for she knew the pen name Philip Johnson was that of her elder son, John Stanley. Through the years, I have often thought that I should like to reveal to you the real name of the author who wrote this poem. The words were sent without my brother's knowledge to the press by his friend, a Quaker doctor serving with the Red Cross. Please forgive me if I have bored you with these reminiscences, but I have always wanted to uncover the anonymity of my noble brother, Philip Johnson, in quotes, and to thank you for the words in your article, which gave so much pleasure to my mother and to me. So it's not until 1969 that the identity of Philip Johnson is revealed and it's the man on the left of the picture here, John Stanley Purvis. On the, on the, on the right is Re Reverend Loveday of Dorchester, but here's Purvis again. Now, everyone who has an interest, he, he is the author of the poem Chance Memory. He is Philip Johnson. And that's not revealed until half a century after the, the war ends. Now, everybody who has an interest in the city of York and in the history of York knows John Stanley Purvis. Everyone knows Canon Purvis. He is really a towering figure in the history of the city and also a towering figure in the history of the university. So here, and I apologize for the, for the, for the indecent brevity, brevity, here is what almost everybody will know about Canon Purvis, John Stanley Purvis. And I'm, do, I'm being very brief about this because I want to tell the story as it were of, the, of, of his alter ego of um, Philip Johnson of the, of the poet. But almost everyone knows John, of John Stanley Purvis. And here, here are some details. He's born in Bridlington on the 9th of May, 1890. And he attended Bridlington Grammar School and then St. Catherine's College, Cambridge, where he read history. In 1913, he began teaching at Cranley School, which is, of course, on the South Downs, there's Cranley and near Stenning. In 1932, he was ordained a deacon. And in 1938, he left Cranley and returned to Yorkshire, where in 1939, he became archivist to the Archbishop of York and occupied, was closely involved, famously, famously, closely involved with Oliver Sheldon and others in establishing the Borthwick Institute in St Anthony's Hall here. And indeed, he became the first director of the Borthwick. Even more famously, he wrote the first modern text of the mystery plays. And here he is. I do apologize, I cannot date this production of the mystery plays. I'm sure it's datable, but it hasn't been datable by me because I, I've, because I haven't been able to get to the relevant place. But I put it here because um, amongst other things, uh, it contains, uh, it's, it's a production which includes Ju Judy Dench. Um, and, he was, Canon Purvis was, um, producer, as it were, architect of the early, the, the mystery plays. And as an aside, that picture of Canon Purvis with his sister was, which I showed you earlier, was taken outside Buckingham Palace when he went there to receive an OBE for services to historical scholarship. So he's very, very well known in the history of, of York. He's a towering figure, he's hugely influential. But what about, not canon purpose, but Philip Johnson? What about, what about him? 
the author of Chance Memory. And in the remainder of this talk, what I want to do is to try to answer that question. What about Philip Johnson, author of Chance Memory? Here he is, John Stanley Purvis, taken during the Great War when he was a member of the 5th Battalion of Alexandra Prince of Wales's own Yorkshire regiments, the Greenhowards. And here is his younger brother, George Purvis. And here are the two brothers together. Um, George on the right and, uh, sorry, George on the left and John Stanley Purvis on, on the right. Um, George is very, very dashing, I, I think. Um, and here's the story of their war career and then some speculation from me. So John Stanley Purvis, Canon Purvis, here he is, was born in May of 1890 and his brother George here was born in September of 1892. In April of 1915, George, the young, the, the brother, he's very, very dashing. I don't know, we're not supposed to say it, but he's very dashing, he's very handsome. Um, he, was, he, he was sent to the Western Front and was involved in both the Battle of the Somme and the attack on High Wood, the hell that was High Wood in September of 1916. In June of 1917, he was killed at Passion Day. So the nature of the war, which John Stanley, as it were, witnessed and George endured and died in, was brutal. Um, he was at High Wood, he was at the Somme, he was at Passchendaele, and he died, a young man, in the most terrible and bloody of wars. And this next slide, excuse me, shows the general area where both of the, where, where both of the brothers fought. So here is the battle of the area of the Somme, and this is the area to focus on, Albert. This is Albert, and this is High Wood. And this is where both John Stanley and his brother fought in the, in the area between Albert at the Battle of High Wood. And I want to say a little bit here about the, about the Battle at High Wood because it will become important as we as we go on. I've noted that John, that, sorry, that George Purvis was at the Somme from the beginning. He enlisted in 1914 and he remained at the Somme and was involved in the notorious attack on High Wood in September of 1916. By contrast, John Stanley Purvis, Canon Purvis, enlisted much later. He was commissioned on the 14th of March 1916 and his first engagement in battle was at Highwood. It was when he went over the top at Highwood. And it's worth pausing here just to say something about the battle and I'll return to the, the picture of the brothers because it's, it's, it's more interesting to see them. The Battle of the High Wood raged for 64 days. It opened with a disastrous cavalry charge and ended with an abortive first use of tanks. Every British attack was repelled and High Wood became known as the rottenest place on earth. Eventually, on September 15th, the British army overwhelmed the German army but the British general, Charles Barter, was relieved of command for wanton waste of men. So this is the site of the Battle for High Wood in which both brothers were involved, John Stanley and George. John Stanley 
was injured at Highwood and subsequently was invalided out. So our man, as it were, Canon Purvis, was injured there and was invalided out, apparently with um, shell shock or the suffering from shell shock or what, what's now called post-traumatic stress disorder. He returned to the front on the 17th of March, um, in March of 1917, but after that news came very rapidly of the death of his brother at Passchendaele. And with that, John Stanley Purvis was removed from the front line, probably on compassionate grounds. So the picture that emerges here of John Stanley Purvis, Canon Purvis, is of a man who was seriously unlucky in war, seriously scarred by war, and probably deeply unsuited to it in his personality, his personality. And so those are the facts. And I just tell my own story now, uh, having always been very, having been very, very uh, fond of this poem for a long, long time, the chance meeting, um, having been fond, fond of that for a long, long time, and having then discovered that it's a poem written by Canon Purvis, I thought I'd take myself, I'd take myself up to the Borthwick and to have a look at what was there um, that might be of interest. And I then thought I'd take myself off to the Green Howards Museum in Richmond and think about, find out what was there that might be of interest. And what comes now is just a very, very rough idea of what's to be said, what the backstory is to that, that poem that I read to you, Chum's Memory. So first of all, here up in the Borthwick is a loose copy of Chum's Memory. And it says, so here's the first mystery. It says Daily Telegraph, 2nd of December, 1915. It was not published in the Daily Telegraph in the, on the 2nd of December, 1915. It was published in the Daily News on the 23rd of June, 1916. So it says what isn't true. It also says on the left-hand side, written in the trenches, Belgium, 1915. Well, it wasn't written in the trenches in Belgium in 1915. Um, so, so this actual loose copy um, is, is mysterious. I'm just going to leave it there. It's just absolutely mysterious. But this poem, if you go up to the Borthwick, this poem is just one poem that is loose. It's a loose piece of paper. Um, but also there is, is this, a notebook which is entitled, labelled, named, Notes for the Cranleyan, Verses and Fragments, 1912 to 1917. And this notebook that I'm showing you now contains about 60 poems, all handwritten, all dated between 1912 and 1917, all poems written by Canon Purvis, John Stanley Purvis. Some of the poems, there, there it is, it's rough, it's rough about, and it's just full. I, 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 I feel really extraordinarily excited when I look at it, even from this great distance. It is full of poems written by Canon Purvis, by John Stanley Purvis. Now, some of these poems, I, I'm not a literary expert, but I, I think it's fair to say some of these poems are a bit sort of clunky. Um, some are immensely poignant and moving. And I think, but this is just speculation now, I think they tell a story. And I think the story they tell is the story of a very sensitive man's personal grief at the death of his pupils, at the death of his brother, and at the death of his contemporaries. And they chart, or so it seems to me, 
these 50, 60, I don't know how many poems, a lot of them, they chart, I think, a mounting despair at the state of humanity. So that's my hypothesis, but it's only a hypothesis and it's something I'd like to look at you know, when everything opens up and we can go back to libraries and do normal things. But I do believe that this notebook, per, the, the, the Purvis notebook, charts the history of a man's growing disillusion with the war in which he finds himself and the war which will kill his brother. So the early poems in the book are really quite sort of Kipling-esque, they're quite gung-ho. And here's a bit of one, um, the early poem Departure for the Front, which obviously is written as they're, as they're going. Um, Edens, ours is a hope as high, a joy as strong, a field as spacious and a cause as rare. England our, our theme, in all the world our song, the glory of England and our only care. So these early poems are celebratory. Here we come into battle, um, defending England, celebrating England, saluting England. Um, they're very, very celebratory. And, and some of them are, I mean, quite, as I say, quite gung-ho and Kipling-esque. But as time goes on, as I read it, and this is my interpretation, as I read it, these poems become darker and more despondent and more despairing and eventually cynical. And obviously there isn't time to consider all these poems, so what, because there are a lot of them. So what I'll do now is to focus on just two. The first, and this is the manuscript, is called The Last Mess in Billets. Um, I just get the text in front of me. That's, it's, it's, a, it's a photocopy and it's, and it's poor. But it's worth noting that at the bottom of the page, it says that this poem, it's, it's dated 15th of September 1916, which is the date of the final assault on High Wood, in which Purvis and his brother, the two Purvis boys, both took part, in which Jack Jack Purvis, as they call him at the Green Howards, Jack Purvis was injured, injured out and returned. So this is the last mess in billets. This is the poem written by Purvis before, um, before, the, before this hell that was Highwood, before this dreadful, dreadful carnage. And I'll read the poem, but I read it over this photograph, because this is just a generic photograph, but it gives you an idea of what the last mess in billets might have been like before they go into battle. This is, this is John Purvis, last mess in billets. The thought floats unawares into my mind. This is the last night here. The moment slips even now from us to the past. What shall we find up yonder? You with laughter on your lips, a misty face beyond the lamp, a gleam of eyes beyond the glow, across the shine of knives and glass and bottles, amber, gold, or clear as water. Jack, who next to mine, stretches his slim brown hand upon the cloth towards the delicate stemmed bubble of glass, which holds a liquid jewel, red as wrath. And all of us, and to your lips move mine, answer your laughter, and things spoken pass, while all the time my heart is whispering the last night here. To this loved company, what things tomorrow if tomorrow be, and a commonplace word is said, and a thought takes wing, and is lost beyond in the gun's fierce thundering. This poem is in dramatic contrast to the earlier one. Um, there isn't any 
jingoism, gung-ho attitude. There is no lording of battle, no appeal to the glory of England. There's fear. There is fear of whether there will be a tomorrow, and if there is a tomorrow, what it will, what it will bring. And that's just one of dozens of poems in that notebook. Um, but that's not all. There are, there are dozens of poems. Some of them are a bit clunky, but a lot of them are immensely poignant. And that's one of them. Those are the words of a young man about to go into battle. But that's not all, because in addition to the, the poems and especially the notebook poems, there are also in the book Borthwick here in York and also in the Green Hides Museum in Richmond, there are drawings and photographs, photographs taken by John Purvis when he was in the, at the Somme and drawings made by him on the Western Front. And I'm going to show you now some of these, these photographs which were taken by, by Purvis. Soldiers from the 5th Battalion, the Green Howards, detonating and fusing Stokes bombs in the rear before marching up to the front lines during the Battle of the Somme, September 1916. And there they are again, that is going up to High, to High Wood, going up for the 15th of September 1916. That's that's the date of the final assault at High Wood. And the next one, these famous tanks, which were used to so little effect at, at High Wood. So these, th those are his pictures, but here also in this, in the, in the Green Howards and also at the Bor Borthwick, they're not just, just the photographs, but also drawings many, many, many drawings of the battlefield of the Somme. And here's just one, um, dated the 15th of September, 1916. And so this is simply to say that there is in the Borthwick and in the Green Howards Museum, an enormous and fascinating, and as far as I can see, largely unresearched body of work by I don't know what to call him. John Stanley Purvis, Jack Purvis, Canon Purvis, Philip Johnson. Um, they're all these poems, all these resources, drawings, pictures, and they tell an extraordinary story, a story of the glory of battle to begin with, of despondency, de depression, despair as battle goes on and men, men are lost. And finally, and this will be finally, of a deep, deep cynicism. Chance Memory is not the only poem by Philip Johnson that, as it were, went public, went into the public domain. There is a poem which is perhaps even more famous called High Wood, or to give it its proper title, The Tourist's Complete Guide to the Battlefields. And this poem was published in the nation in June of 1916, under the pseudonym Philip John Stone, T-O-N-E, under the name Philip John Stone, not John Son, as the earlier one was. And this poem, it is a deeply cynical poem. It's told, as it were, by a tour guide who is taking the visitors, taking the tourists, taking the school children around the battleground of High Wood, and who is vainly trying to prevent them from dropping their crisp packets and um, leaving their canned drinks uh, as, they, as they go along. And the cynicism mounts and mounts in, in, this, in this poem. And on the back of this poem, in the manuscript version at the Borthwick, is written GBP, killed June the 8th, 1917. News brought June the 16th, 1917. So as he's, as John Purvis is writing this, he is thinking about or revising it, his brother who was killed at Passchendaele on the 8th of June, 1917, and the news was brought. 
in June 1960, sorry, on the 16th of June, 1917. This poem, High Wood, was the Guardian poem of the week in November of 2008. And the Guardian says, Philip Johnston appears to have been a pseudonym and little is known about the author of this prophetic poem, which was written in 1918. Well, what I've tried to indicate is that we actually do know quite a lot now about Philip Johnston. We know that he's Canon Purvis. We know that he was a Canon here at York Minster. We know he was in the Green Howards. We know, we know that he lost his brother at Passchendaele. And it seems to me quite possible that he did not wish, as so many, he did not wish to revisit that or to think about it again in a public way. But I think now you've heard enough from me. And so I'm going to try, if the technology will let me, to end by playing Sir John Gielgud reading Philip Johnson's poem, Highwood. Ladies and gentlemen, this is High Wood, called by the French Bois des Fourneaux, the famous spot which in 1916, July, August and September was the scene of long and bitterly contested strife by reason of its high commanding site. Observe the effect of shell fire in the trees standing and fallen. Here is wire. This trench for months inhabited, 12 times changed hands they soon fall in, used later as a grave. It has been said on good authority that in the fighting for this patch of wood were killed somewhere above 8,000 men, of whom the greater part were buried here, this mound on which you stand being, Madame, please, you are requested kindly not to touch or take away the company's property as souvenirs, you will find we have on sale a large variety, all guaranteed. As I was saying, all is as it was, this is an unknown British officer, the tunic having lately rotted off. Please follow me this way. The path, sir, please. The ground, which was secured at great expense, the company keeps absolutely untouched. And in that dugout, genuine, we provide refreshments at a reasonable rate. You are requested not to leave about paper or ginger beer bottles or orange peel. There are waste paper baskets at the gate. So there it is, John Stanley Purvis, Kenan Purvis, author of the poems that I've been showing, reading to you, a well-known translator of mystery plays, um, and a serious figure in the history of York. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Sue. Thank you for an absolutely fascinating account. Um, I think all of us will have learned a lot from that. Um, I certainly only knew about him really as a, an elderly gentleman, um, and I read about his reputation in the founding of the university on which he was uh, very keen. Um, I'd like to thank you now for the talk. You've opened up um, a mystery really, uh, you know, that it leaves as many questions unanswered as are answered. Um, we have a few questions from people watching, so I'll go over to those in a minute, but I'd just like to take this opportunity for thanking you very much and also for thanking our technician, Steve, and for Naomi uh, for all her work in coordinating these lectures. It's wonderful to have this opportunity and I know they put in an awful lot of backroom work. So a big thank you to them. Then I'll move over to the questions. Now we've got um, four or five questions so we may not have time for all of them but um, I'm sure Sue will do her best. And if anybody has a question which is unanswered or an observation, um, could you send it to the Festival of Ideas and they'll pass it on to Sue and she's very willing to try to answer those questions for you, um, you know, by email at a later date. Um, so thank you very much for that. Um, now, just one comment I was going to make. You were talking about that photograph of the mystery plays, which includes mm, Judy yes. Dench. Well, that, I'm almost certain that was the first 
um, mystery plays in 1951 when they were first revived. And the reason I think that is because we have those photos in the archives at the Mount. Yeah. And in 1951, Judy Dench played the part of the angel Gabriel yeah. among the angels. And in the and Mary Ewer, who was a bit older than her, who actually became a very famous actress, but sadly died fairly young. Um, but um, in the second set of mystery plays, which took place in 1954, three years later, um, Judy Dench then played the Virgin Mary. Ah, oh, okay. And that one, where she's the right. angel, I'm pretty certain that's 1951. Yeah. But just to clear that one up. No, thank you, Sarah. I, 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 what I've found with with lockdown and so on is is just that there are things you become aware of what a sloppy scholar you are. Or I I do anyway because there are things and I hadn't written on it or made a note yeah. that this is 51. And now I can't go anywhere yeah. to find out because it's all locked down. I know so it's it's clear. awful. I'm, I'm very frustrated. I'm trying to get to the Baltic. I haven't been there for really pretty much well, a year <laughs> and anyway form an orderly queue i think is the <laughs> yes, yes. anyway i have some very interesting questions so um the first one was um is there any reason that you can think of why he didn't want to reveal his identity when that um, first poem was published but I guess that is, I mean, that's that's the question that's, that stalks in, in all of this. I think, you know, the, the, the use of, of, a, of a pen name, a pseudonym is, is quite is quite standard. It's not nothing, nothing odd there. But what I find, this isn't to answer the question, but what I find haunting is the message from his sister to Ernest Raymond. And Hilda Purvis just says, well, all these years I wanted you to know that this, I wanted to say that this might, obviously she and her and her mother really worshipped him. And she wants, wants it to be known that he is the author, but she can't say until he, it's only when he dies, that's when she can say. Now, why he didn't want it to be known, I, I wonder if it's, if it's, there may be no particular reason at all, but, but I wonder if, if it is, if it's this, um, Although he starts in those notebooks really quite patriotic and, and gung-ho, for want of a better expression, as the poems go on and the years go on, he becomes more and more deeply cynical about what's happening here in, in the 1418 war. And I do wonder whether he did not wish to go public on that cynicism, given his position in the church or late, or his view his later position in the church I simply don't know but I, I think there is a, there is a mounting cynicism um, in in these in these verses and I just wonder whether it's something to do with with that with his own attitude towards towards war and his own feeling that it was a wicked thing mm, thank you um, I was a bit interested in that um, one of the later poems was published in The Nation, yes. because that newspaper um, belonged to or was bought by um, the Roundtrees and Arnold Roundtree and J.B. Morrell would, even by 1916, I think have had some influence on it. And an anti or a, a less pro-war poem would have obviously found um, a hearing in the nation when it might not have been some other in some other that's an interesting thought yes yeah that's just a thought right yes um then we have another question um if you could meet purvis today what question would you ask him oh i think i would ask him why i think i would ask him why he was so concerned to keep his identity secret because I, I, I think there's evidence that he, he was, it, it's not just an ordinary, you know, nom de plume. I think he, he made efforts to ensure that people didn't know that this was, was him, um, as, as evidenced by his, his sister's letter, which I just referred to. So I think I'd want to know why it was that um, he wanted to keep his identity secret. And I suppose what lies behind that would be a question about, what what he really felt morally about about the war yes it sort of relates back doesn't it to yeah. the, the earlier right. question yes um 
someone else has asked, do you think there's any chance of the poems being published now? Well, that is a really good question. Um, I, it's, it's not, it's not for me to say, and 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 so I, I don't. But I, I think you, and I'm not a, I, my expertise is not in, in poetry at all. Um, but I think it would be a wonderful thing if they could be, if they could be published, because I've read you. I mean, basically, I've, I've. I've considered briefly, very briefly, three poems, but there are dozens and dozens of poems. Now, obviously some are better than others um, and, and some are a bit clunky, but there are dozens of really heartbreakingly sad poems written whilst he's out on, on the Western Front. There are drawings, pen and ink drawings to go to go with all of those, dozens and dozens of them, and also the photographs and drawings that are that are at the Green Howard. Um, so I really hope that they they could be published one way or another, and I hope that at the very least there could be some display or exhibition or something of of that kind. But um, that's outside outside my. Well, there's, that's a nice little hint, isn't it? <laughs> Well, you know, <laughs> possibly to the Borthwick. Yeah, you, you drop a hint and you never know, you know, what, what people may uh, pick up. What people may pick up. Someone else has asked an inter quite interesting question. Um, both her uncles on her mother's side were at Cranley School in the 1920s and right. early 30s. So she said they may have been taught by John Stanley Purvis. Do you know what subject he taught? Um, I'm interested in that as well, because I'm wondering about this literary background and how he later came to the mystery plays. I, I assume he taught history because his degree was in history, but I may be wrong about that. And if they're interested in that, I suggest that if you if you go up, there is the, there is a Cranley School website, which contains a lot of information, quite a lot of information about John Stanley Purvis actually as as well. Um, so, so I would suggest that they they look at they look at that. Um, for for information. Yes, thank you. Um, now we have another interesting one. Um, this is where, you know, when we look at how things are published, it raises all sorts of questions. But uh, someone has asked um, the fact that Chance Memory was published in the newspaper on the same page as Kipling's words. Um, do we know at all if Purvis and Kipling ever met each other in the Brighton area? I mean, Kipling would have been quite a lot older than Purvis, wouldn't he? I don't don't know what I uh, perhaps didn't read, but what is interesting, if I can find it, um, is is that Chance Memory was published in the um, was 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 published not through any doing of Purvis, as far as I'm aware. It was a Quaker ambulance man, apparently, if I can only find the piece here, who sent it. Who sent the poem to the the newspaper? And I can't find it now. Um, but I'm I'm pretty confident that it it wasn't his doing that it was published. It was a it was um, a, a a Quaker ambulance man who, for whatever reason, um, took it upon himself to send this to the Daily News, and they published it. Yes, again, that raises all sorts of interesting questions, really, about his possible connections with um, organisations like the Friends Ambulance Unit. Exactly. That, that sort of thing. Yes, so it that does. That and in I itself is very interesting. And I just don't know the answer. I don't, there's a huge body of work there. And I just don't know the answer to any of it, I, I have to say, because there is so, there is so much. And certainly things, I, I mentioned one mystery, excuse me, I rustle around here. Um, which, which is about chance memory. Um, it's, it's, it's marked up in various ways, written in the trenches in Belgium, but this, this, can't, be, this can't be true um, because he wasn't in the, the trenches in Belgium at that, at that date. So the whole thing is, um, I'm, I'm not a historian by training, but it does need a historian by training to have a good look at this and work out 
what's like, what was what's going, going on. on yeah and the yeah. annotations on some of the poems if you look at the poems up in the borthwick there there are their hands who which have written now i i'm neither a, a very good historian nor a handwriting expert but it, it needs that sort of attention to work out what on earth has happened and i really just don't know well i think that's a wonderful point at which to stop thank you <laughs> um, uh, the association of Purvis with the mystery plays mm -hmm. and this other alternative sort of mystery is, is very intriguing, but I would really like to know more in future about how it was he came to be involved yeah. in the, because what he did with the mystery plays, he rendered that Lucy Toulmin Smith um, original translation into something which was essentially very dramatic. Yeah. Yeah wonderfully um, playable and learnable and recitable and the you know the, the way the couplets are and the use of the language I mean that is just marvellous even given the text that he had to be able to translate that into something which people people could perform so well and really is now ingrained in lots of York people's memories I think there's one person left who has been in every single mystery <laughs> play since 1951 <laughs> But um, that that really is fascinating. Well, thank you so much, Sue, for that. I'm I'm getting on with my thanks because I'm slightly nervous that any minute now we're going to get we'll cut so off by, the, know, by we'll, the powers that be. Yeah, we'll fall um, off the end of the world. We're going to fall off the end of the world. But if people do have any more questions for Sue, please don't forget um, that you can send them to her using the Festival of Ideas email link. And... Um, she will do her best to answer them, or I'm sure, if not, she will rush off to the Borthwick as soon as possible. <laughs> try to find the answers for us. But thank you very much indeed. And well, thank I hope you. everyone else is really enjoying the festival. And, um, and so are we. <laughs> thank you very much.